recording. Give it a few seconds. Cool. We're going in ambient audio, so speak loudly. Okay. Good morning, everyone. How's everyone doing? Good. Just making sure we're talking about career paths, so just make sure I was in the wrong room originally. So, um, so this is kind of what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, taking the next steps in your cybersecurity infosec career. Um, one of the things is we want to talk about is how do we manage your career? Uh, what are the next steps, whether you're starting new or you've been in the industry for a while? And then we'll talk a little bit about training, certifications, and boot camps and different ways you can continue to skill yourself. And then finally, how important um, soft skills, finding a mentor, um, coach and, and really having someone to back you in, in your development of your career. So just by show of hands, how many people in here um, are new to, to InfoSec cybersecurity? Okay. And then how many people have five plus, ten plus years of experience? Okay, so good mix. And also, I really want this to be interactive, so feel free to ask any questions as we're going through. I'm happy to answer anything you have. Um, so I'll just tell a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Connie Matthews. I'm the CEO and founder of Rencon um, Educational Services and Training. Um, I'm super excited. I actually am from Columbus, Ohio, and I'm the second uh, woman-owned cybersecurity company in the state of Ohio. Um, so I was really excited uh, to open the company. Um, I'm very much about advocating careers in STEM. Uh, I'm a huge mentor and coach. I have probably, in my 17 years, have probably mentored I don't know, 100, 150 people, and I continue to do that because I feel it's really important. And then I also sit on advisory roles for colleges and universities to help them build their cybersecurity program. Thank you. And I sit, as you can see, on several boards. Um, I also sit on the Central Ohio ISSA um, board. I've been on that 13 years. Has anyone ever gone to the Columbus InfoSec Summit? The people from Columbus, of course. So. Um, so we also have a summit very similar um, in Columbus, Ohio, and you guys should come and join us if, uh, if you can. All right, so managing your career. When you look at this list, um, how many people agree that when you're in cybersecurity, it's something that you constantly need to learn? So do you think it's a, a career where you can just be stagnant and never open a book or read? So obviously, that's good. We're all on the same page there. Um, I also think you need to willing, be willing to challenge yourself because I think about when I started 17 years ago to now, especially with the movement of the cloud, which the cloud a lot of times is really a big application, and a lot of people in cybersecurity started with more of an infrastructure background. So there's all these debates whether you should be a full stack developer to be in information security. I don't believe that, but I also feel like how many of you know how to script and write some basic scripting and maybe some... Python or things like that by show hand. Good. Because a lot of the new technologies require some of those skills. I think you need to be assertive. And one of the biggest things that I think is very, very important is self-awareness. Um, I think there's a lot of people in our industry that are super smart. But I also feel that if you're not aware of who you are and where your strengths and weaknesses are, you really can't grow. Would you agree with that statement? Because um, I like for me, there are some things I'll never be good at, and I totally, fully admit that to myself. But then I try to surround myself with people that are strong in those areas where I can learn from them. Never will be the same as them, but it's just a constant learning path. So since there's a good combination, we'll talk a little bit about both of these. So a lot of people will ask me if I want to go into cybersecurity, what should you do? And when I say this, I'm not against anyone going to college, but I think the things you have to take in consideration is if you're going to go to college, you need to find a college that combines theory and practice. So a lot of articles have come out where like the big four, or the FBI, and a lot of big companies are removing the four-year degree because they're losing out on amazing candidates that didn't potentially go to college. So I sit on Tiffin University, which is in Ohio, um, and I love their program I and mean, as an advisor for them. They actually teach, they have, they build a SOC, the Network Operations Center, <coughs> and their students actually work as part of their curriculum in there. They bring in like capture the flags, they do a lot of real world experience, they have to do internships their junior and senior year. And I will say that 
they graduate 35 to 50 kits, and generally when they graduate, they all have jobs in cybersecurity with no experience within 30 or 60 days, which is really kind of unheard of. So I think if you're gonna do that, make sure you do your research um, on the programs. Um, if you're more of a seasoned person, a lot of people will tend to go and get a degree so they can get into a leadership role. And then that, by that time in your career, you know how to kind of balance theory and practice. Um, obviously there's security training courses, boot camps, um, all kinds of certifications, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. And then one of the, the questions I ask people when I mentor them that don't have experience, one of my first questions is, do you have a lab at your house? So for the people that are new, do you have a lab in your home? So I would recommend you do that, and you don't have to go out and buy a bunch of equipment. You can do virtualization. But I've helped a lot of young people with no experience where they've built labs, and they can actually talk about the methodologies of using the tool, being able to kind of rationalize and go through how they're securing maybe their own home network. And at the end of the day, it's a lot, it's the same thing whether you're securing two things or a thousand things. The process is generally very similar. And obviously the larger it gets, the more issues you have, but just kind of understanding how to do that is important. Um, how many of you heard of this, like don't be afraid to break things? So in cybersecurity, I think if you're afraid to break things, you're going to probably be in a little bit of trouble. Because um, I look at cybersecurity, InfoSec is reverse engineering everything. And then I think it's really important to understand and learn fundamentals. Um, how many people think it would be easy to secure a firewall if you didn't know how to configure a firewall, you knew nothing about it? Or how would you secure a server if you don't know how to set up a server? Or how would you secure wireless if you don't understand how it works. And I said this earlier, but I really truly believe security a lot of times is reverse engineering. And then practical experience. So if you can't do internships and you don't have an opportunity, that whole self-study and creating your own lab could be huge in your opportunities for finding. And then how many of you have a mentor or coach? So the ones that didn't raise your hand, I would highly, highly encourage that you find one. My whole entire career, I've always had mentors and coaches. Um, they are great advocates for you, um, and it can open up a lot of opportunities. Um, for the people that don't have a mentor or coach, is it because, are you afraid to ask someone to mentor or coach you? So that's good, because a lot of people are. But I will say, um, I'm not as familiar with this community, because like I said, I'm from Columbus. Um, but I know some of the people in the audience are Columbus. We're really good if someone comes up and says, hey, can we grab coffee? or can we brainstorm about stuff? Can you look at my resume? We tend to be a community that does that. And I hear that you guys are this way here too. So I would encourage for the people in the room that are more seasoned to reach out to some of the younger people. And we can learn from them too, so it's not always just one way. And then when you talk about seasoned, I mean, this, the list is obviously pretty similar. Um, security training courses, boot camps, certifications, constant learning, being assertive, asking questions. Um, college degree, <coughs> degree program, like I mentioned, a lot of times people will go back to college if they want a leadership role. And then again, finding a mentor and coach. And for the people that are seasoned, do you still think once you have five plus years of experience, it's good to have a mentor or coach? You guys are quiet. It's not too <laughs> early. And you got coffee, so I mean, please, if you guys have questions, please let me know. All right, so we're gonna talk a little bit about training certifications that are available. I will tell you, I don't have everything on these slides because there would be just too many things, but I just wanna give you some ideas of what's out there. So we're gonna kind of break them down into governance, risk, compliance, network, security, and app development and security side. A lot of people get really weird about, a lot of times we say GRC, but I know people in governance and I know people in risk and compliance and they get hairy about what those words are, so that's why I have it separated, but there is a lot of overlap. And then we're gonna talk about security awareness training, security training as a whole, uh, leadership skills and soft skills. <coughs> so when you think about governance, um, obviously these are all um, ISACA certifications and there's more than this, but does anyone in the room have any of these three certifications? Which one do you have? CISA. Okay, anybody else? Oh, okay, so 
these are tend to, these will tend to like on risk jobs and governance and compliance jobs. These are typical sometimes of the certifications they'll be asking. And again, this is not a catch all, so it's not everything, but just an idea. And then risk and compliance. Um, here's, I mean, obviously there's some PCI, there's PMI. How many, how many people have a PMP? So a lot of people in security, um, I mean, a PMP is a good because when you guys, do, when we do large projects, it's always good to have someone that kind of pulls it all together. Um, and then, you know, there's the cap and the C risk again, the ISC squared. Um, does anyone want to throw anyone out that they think would be good? This is, if it means I'm doing a good job if everyone doesn't have any questions for this. So then um, when we get into network security, um, these are probably the more common <laughs> ones. Um, are, is anyone familiar with most of these, like PC, RAC Council, Mile 2? Um, those tend to be more of, in the CompTIA, yeah, those tend to be more of like the pen testing, vulnerability assessments, those things. So these are definitely more of the technical. Um, the CISSP isn't necessarily so technical. Anyone have that? So that's a pretty common one, and that really covers all of their domains in cybersecurity. Um, I think, is it five years? They always change or is it seven now? But you have to have years of experience, five, okay. So you have to have five years of documented um, experience to take this cert. But if you're new, I would really recommend you like maybe taking a class or getting the book because it covers all the domains in security and it really does help you kind of understand fully like what security looks like. And then we have application security. Um, any app security people in the audience? One person. <laughs> this is probably the biggest area we need help. Um, are you, have you guys heard, like, five years ago, we had about a quarter of a million shortage in cybersecurity. Now it's up to four million, and it continues to grow. So if you have interested in the application side, um, I will tell you app security people are probably, and I'm not all about money, but they're probably the most high-paid positions in security because it's almost impossible to find them. Um, and right now, with the way we're trending, if you have an interest, I would highly recommend because that need's going to just continue to grow and grow. And then security awareness again, uh, there's a lot more than this. Um, so there's no before, media pro, COPEN, SANS, and then there's a, con there's a ton of like proof point, I think, has some areas of security awareness. So security awareness is not hard to find. Um, and I'm also seeing a very large trend with big companies. They have a whole entire team that's devoted to security awareness and building that out because studies show, I mean, I think we can all agree. I think sometimes in security, we tend to be good cop, bad cop, and we're almost like the parent telling people you shouldn't do this and slapping their hands. And really, in my opinion, a security awareness is more of a behavioral issue and psychological versus doing things. So how do we relate to the people that we're trying to get this message out to also make good decisions, which in turn makes us our jobs a lot easier, to be honest? So again, these are kind of some of the other things. These are just some other examples of training and certs. Um, I would say like, it seems like a lot of people like the CEH, which is the Certified Ethical Hacker. Um, SANS has a, a tons of classes. How many people have taken a SANS class? And can you kind of throw out numbers? How much did you pay for the SANS class with travel? 12 grand. Anybody else? I didn't pay for it. <laughs> I mean, like, or your company. <laughs> your company. Yeah, or 12 and was that for a five day or four? Six. Six, OK. And, and I'm not saying that SANS is bad, but if for any of you, are any of you leaders or man, do you manage groups of people? So, I mean, can you afford, if you have a team of 60, can you afford to send 60 people to a 12 grand class? We, we, we do, but we can't. Wow. And that's not <laughs> the typical. Yeah. And the thing that I do find that I think is interesting is, again, Saying I have a lot of friends that are SANS instructors, great, great courses, but there's a lot of other things out there that are way less expensive. Um, and now you have options. So most companies can't send 60 people at that kind of money. Um, and I know they recently changed to con like to get your CPE, you now have to take SANS courses to get them. So it's this constant battle, like 
if you have to go back every year and spend 12 grand, I don't know if that's really feasible. So a lot of people I know are actually stopping their sand certs because their companies aren't going to pay 12 grand every year to, to do a course. And even if you do it online, like in the state of Ohio, they have a subscription and I think it's like 10% discount. So they don't have the travel, but it's not even very discounted. And it's pre-recorded stuff that people watch. So uh, leadership skills, obviously there are several. Um, and I think we're going to talk a little bit about soft skills and how important they are. But if you want to grow in your career, um, these are areas and some sorts that you can look at. Um, and I would definitely recommend having a mentor or coach again, because I think it's a lot easier to have someone you can run ideas and a trusted advisor. Okay, soft skills. So I have pretty good relationships with most of the CISOs in Columbus, and we have this conversation all the time. And we were actually talking about this upstairs in the speaker room. Critical thinking, problem solving, strong communication skills, being able to write, teamwork, taking initiative, and understanding business. So if I asked you, are you guys all familiar with Nationwide Insurance? All right, so if I asked you what is Nationwide's most critical asset they want to protect, what would you say? Data. What kind of data? Customer. Okay, anybody else? So actually what Nationwide protects more than anything is they make majority of all their money on real estate. They own almost all of downtown Columbus, Ohio. And the research they do in the market analysis that they do on what they decide to buy costs a lot of money. So if someone can steal all of their R&D and all of their intellectual property to make those decisions, they can bid higher because they didn't have to pay that. Another one would be, um, have you guys ever heard of, I mean, I'm sure Scott's Miracle Grow? So what do you think they're trying to protect most? <coughs> the what? The formula for the fertilizer. Okay. So that is really important to them, but they actually have one of the best distributions in the world, and that's what they want to protect, because if someone else can duplicate and steal that, then that's a... And the reason I'm driving this point, as a security practitioner, how can you make decisions to secure the companies you work for when people don't understand the business that they're in. Do you think that's a fair statement? Because, yeah. I mean, when we protect our homes, we know it's the values that we're trying to protect. And it's the same thing. It's the crown jewels and what's important. And we also have to make decisions based on risk and what those risks are within organizations. So understanding the business side is really important. The other thing I will also say, if I was hiring someone and I, if by show of hands, would you rather hire someone that thinks they know everything and they're not willing to learn, or someone that is eager to learn, that shows initiative to learn, and you know that you can kind of train and develop them to what you need? So how many wants, how many people want to hire the first person I just said? No one. That's great. I love it. <laughs> how many would hire the second person? So when... When I talk to CISOs and hiring managers, again, I would say critical thinking and problem solving are two of the most important things you should work on. Um, we also are in an industry where we're never going to be able to solve the problem. So we also have to be patient, but we can make differences. So for us that have been in the industry, when I started to come here tonight, we've made huge strides, but we still have a lot of strides. So every time we kind of figure this out, there's something else that comes. And then by a show of hands, how many people think all of the breaches that have occurred really th think that they were this really crazy, inventive, like never heard of breach? How many people think that that's happened? How many people say that it's fundamentals like never patching, never changing the default passwords, never... Um, and I will tell you, doing this for 17 years, um, I've been on the sales and business development side, and I've probably sold thousands and thousands of security assessments. And every single time we've gotten administrative rights, it's over silly, silly things. And so we continue to invest in all of these expensive tools. And not, I'm not saying we don't need tools, but we need to look at fundamentals. So thinking about 
would you build a million dollar home on a sinkhole? I mean, security kind of has that same thing where we need to understand the fundamentals because as a pen, is anybody a pen tester in here? Okay. So as a pen tester, if I know I can bypass any tool and get administrative rights to the tool help an organization. So it doesn't. So it's really, if, in, my, in my advice is when you're learning security, really focus on fundamentals. Companies don't always want to focus on those, but it's a really important question because a lot of the breaches that have occurred, if we would have focused on fundamentals, they would not have happened the way they are. Now, I will argue once we get those fundamentals taken, it will be something else. But, you know, and I, my, one of my favorite saying is security is a journey, it's not a destination. And then, I've said this many times, finding a mentor or coach, uh, the power of networking, making sure you leverage your network. This is a perfect way. Um, are most of you members of ISSA, ISACA, ISC Squared? So I know there's several people in the room that I know, um, like Jeff in the back, we're both on the ISSA board. Paul helps with our summit. Um, and would you guys say that getting involved has helped you grow relationships? And have you found mentors and coaches? Yeah, or, um, like you said, I'm just one of those there are so many, you know, the different chapter meetings and such, there are so many different people there that you can find. <laughs> and I just told people, when I was in Atlanta a few weeks ago, to make sure a lot of these students will join these different groups. And then I also will say, look for the movers and shakers in the industry. Um, follow me, like LinkedIn, Twitter. Follow some of the people that are really well respected. Now, I will tell you, sometimes you have to get through some egos. Um, but I, I kind of read things, and if you kind of start to see patterns and you see it all the time, you can generally make some safe assumptions that what they're saying is somewhat correct. Um, look, Brian Krebs is probably one of the most famous bloggers in the cybersecurity space. Uh, we were very fortunate. We actually, was it two years ago that we had him? Or was it last year? Two. Two. Um, so we have Brian Krebs as one of our keynotes um, in Columbus. Um, and it was just really interesting to your story. And a lot of people have, like will say that he's a little arrogant. But I will tell you, I got a lot of time to meet him and sit down with him. And he was just a great guy. Um, and then have any of you guys ever watched Catch Me If You Can? So Frank Abigail, he also was a keynote and just phenomenal. And so it's like when you hear these people speak, these are great people. You can go out and you know and listen and really kind of read their links at LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, and don't be afraid, like if you have someone on LinkedIn that's really connected, to leverage some of those relationships too. And then um, I'm not sure if they distribute it, but I just wanted I put a few links in here um, that people can use that kind of give different opinions. Some of these will actually talk about what are the most sought after certifications. Now, what I will tell you is, depending on where you go, those rotate a little bit. Um, some of them focus on ISACA certs. Some of them focus more on the technical certs. So not to say that any of these are 100% right, but it kind of gives you an idea of what people are looking for. And then are any of you familiar with the NICE framework? <laughs> so that's, a, and I don't think I put that on here. Oh, I did. This is a really good one. So NICE is kind of a standard for training that a lot of organizations are using. This came out of NIST in the federal government. What I will tell you, it's heavily, heavily aligned to certifications. So you can take that with a grain of salt, and I'm not saying you should run out and pay for a ton of certs, but it can give you some ideas of what types of resources and kind of what people are looking for. Um, and it kind of helps with just kind of seeing where things are going, and again, um, I feel like we have buzzword bingo in our industry. Um, how many of you are um, uh, know about the MITRE ATT&CK framework? Have you heard of it? So the MITRE ATT&CK framework is a relatively new framework that, and it's spelled like M-I-T-R, I think. Yeah. But it's the, I don't think there's an ampersand or something in it And when you look it up online. But um, that's a framework I feel like everybody, like every big company I'm working with is on bandwagon with it. So I'm not saying to focus on going into all these different things because they do change, but those are good resources to kind of look and review to get information on. Um, and then 
getting involved, I think, is crucial. So I'm not, I'm not sure how active these are, uh, but I kind of put what's in, in this area. Um, I don't know, can someone tell me what the triangle is because I'm not from this here? Is it just like a geographic area? Maybe? I don't know. Um, so the IC squared. Yeah. So the idea was to go from Lexington to mobile backup homes. Okay. I kind of figured it was a geographical thing. It was weird, but um, so. And I, I'm sorry, I thought I took the Central Ohio one off because I've done this presentation quite a few times. But these are all different groups, I think, locally. I'm not sure how active they are, but these are groups that you can potentially get involved in. Um, and I'm a founding, so I mean, this is just a shameless plug for the, the top one. I'm a founding member of, um, I'm a huge person of diversity um, and working with women and minorities. And so, we are, we just started a Midwest, which I could, I mean, I know Kentucky. Do you guys consider Kentucky South or? Because <laughs> I hear different things. So I don't want to offend anyone, but um, I, I mean, Kentucky, obviously, I, it's a three hour drive, so we're not talking to you. But we um, are having a gala on January 31st in Columbus, Ohio, and it's celebrating women, and it's all about diversity and inclusion. So we want men and women, it doesn't matter your sexual preference, your color, your skin, it's really about empowering all of us and building networks and building out and our one of our goals is in 2021 we're going to be doing scholarships for women in cybersecurity. and we think we'll have around 75 to a hundred thousand dollars to give in scholarships um, so how many of you think that we need more diversity in security and honestly we're missing a whole group of people by doing that so um, like i said i've been a huge advocate of talks about this all the time and then this is my contact information. Um, I'm on Twitter and uh, on LinkedIn, so feel free to connect if you have any questions. I'm not really sure, but I was named one of the top women in cybersecurity to follow on Twitter of 189 women. I'm not really sure how I got that, to be honest, because I don't really use Twitter that much, but I, I'm trying to get better. So um, I don't know if someone just submitted my name, but um, certainly reach out, happy to help. Um, and I think I got through this presentation pretty fast. So does anybody have any questions? Did I do that good of a job that no one has questions? <laughs> on, on last one, you, you mentioned the, uh, the empower women in the, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not through a battle, but I know we do have a very active group of tech ladies yeah. uh, that meets every month uh, and we'll get 30, 40, 50, 60 people, to, uh, a good one of people. Yeah, and I, the part of the reason that I honestly, um, it was myself and eight other ladies that started it, and I always feel like all of the stuff is either in the D.C. area or California, and most companies aren't going to pay to send someone out for a dinner or a gala. And my crazy self, I went on LinkedIn and said, hey, what do you guys think about doing the Midwest and I think over 15,000 people looked at my post and probably four or 500 messages and text messages. So literally three months ago, we decided to do this and or January 31st, we're having it. So I would encourage, um, it's really not that far of a drive. Um, and there's gonna be a lot of amazing women that want to mentor and coach. In fact, we're doing a silent auction and I have three CISOs that are, we're gonna auction off for to sit and have coffee with them an hour apiece. Um, and I mean, can you imagine, like, especially for people that are new, you're going to be around a lot of really powerful people that have accomplished a lot. So it's really about giving back to the community. And um, the first year, we know we'll have most people from Columbus, but the goal is to make it Midwest so that we can outreach just out of Ohio as well. Did... What do you feel about the stigma of having to have a technical background to get over? So that's another talk that I do. Um, when you look at all the domains in cyber, you don't have to have a technical background. So a lot of times you can come in as a project, like so you said you're a project manager. Is that kind of what got your foot into cyber? Or were you in cyber already and kind of did both I started things? in technical and by doing so much engineering work and I slowly just became like an advisor for the project management team okay. and then transitioned into that. So that's a perfect transition where, because 
you be, you probably became really familiar with the terms and you had to start to understand what those things were wrapped around projects and what that mm -hmm. looked like. So to be a good project manager, you need to understand those things. So it was it's probably somewhat of an easier transition for you to move. Um, the uh, have any of you guys ever heard of Helen Patton? Do you know the name? I know Cole's school. So she's basically the system for the Ohio State University Go Bucks. I'm sorry, I have to it. Um, but uh, she, her and I have this conversation all the time, and she hates when we say to women that you don't have to be technical to go into cybersecurity. And I agree with that. So there's been many times when I've mentored young girls, um, and their dads and their older people have said to them, oh, you just need to go in sales. Not saying there's anything against sales, but I want. I think part of it is we need to encourage people, um, regardless of their background, that they can make those moves. And you know, people that have worked at a help desk, a lot of people started as a help desk person, and then they moved into the SOC. So some of the older people, where did you guys start? Well, people that have been in more than five years. I'm old, so I'm like, it's all good. I started a help desk. And then some of you in the back. I started as a sport coordinator. Okay. And did you did you find that having those fundamental basics really helped you in security because you understood those basics and you could just add on learning? Yes. So in my current role with vendor engagement, no offense to anybody else who's in sales, but there's something more frustrating than talking to a sales engineer who really doesn't understand the technical aspects. Of what they're of the product that they're selling, yeah. and then when you do ask, you know, technical aspects of what they are selling, they can't answer it, so they have to bring in a another engineer who may or may not um, be knowledgeable about the specific platform that you're um, trying to get information about. So, I'm not saying that you don't have to have a security background to participate in certain domains yeah. of cyber, but it helps. When you definitely have that base level uh, fundamental understanding of not only technology, but of what you're even selling um, from a vendor engagement standpoint. Now, you know, I've, I've met programmers, and again, nothing against programmers, <laughs> but I've met programmers who don't even know what LDAP means. And how are you going to program an application that has an LDAP connector? into Active Directory when you have absolutely no understanding of what that protocol does and how important it is for you to not hard code and tell that password into your application. Well, and I think, so when I also talk about communication, I didn't cover this. I think sometimes we, in security, we tend to want our audience to understand security, and let's be, let's be quite frank, they don't. But it'd be like, me asking one of you to do open heart surgery on your kids. I had one person tell me they were going to YouTube it, and I was like, I'm pretty sure your wife is not going to allow you <laughs> to have open heart surgery. And so I think we speak a lot of language. And for us that have been around, there are so many acronyms in every industry that mean the same, they mean completely opposite things in different industry. So when you're talking to a business person, you may use an acronym and they have no idea what you're talking about and they think it's completely, and they're like completely lost because it has nothing to do with security. So understanding the business, but, and how many of you are familiar with OWASP? So if you look at the last 15 years, the top reasons why apps get broken into, how, how much do you think that's changed? It's pretty much zero. They've had to combine things because there's more, but like SQL injection, buffer, 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 buffer those cross-site scripting, easy things that we shouldn't be talking about. But part of the problem is application developers, a lot of the programs, they don't teach secure coding. So they teach people how to code. And I've never understood why we're even having these conversations because where all the information you want to protect is either in the app or the database. And so if we're not building secure apps, and oh, by the way, where do we get a lot of it? We go to libraries. So I see this all the time where they pull the library, they bring someone in to do a test, they fix all that, but guess what? They never go back to the libraries and fix all those vulnerabilities. And so this is why I'm saying if you have interest in the app, 
um, app security, it's definitely a great way to go because that's where most of the data is. And so I think it's really important to understand that. And then, you know, and like what you were saying, it's true. And I think part of us, our security, uh, security experts is when they don't understand, we need to have a conversation with them and explain it to them, but in a way that is meaningful and useful for both parties. Because how many of you like being told that you're dumb or stupid or you have no idea what you're doing or you're incompetent? I'm pretty sure none of us want to have that conversation. <laughs> and sometimes the way security people approach other people in the business, that's how they're made to feel. And for people that have worked on help desk, I mean, God love anyone that's worked on a help desk a long time because you have to deal with a lot of crazy. Um, but if you treat people well at the help desk and security operations centers, I mean, they're like the hugest, hugest advocates from a security perspective because they see everything. And they also know what's normal and what's abnormal. Most of us in security, we don't really know that other than logs and you fine tune them. But if someone completely rewrote an application to do something different, a lot of security people would never know until unless someone called us and said, hey, something's not looking right. So having those relationships that cross the lanes, um, whether it's in the security operations, the business side is really important. Does that answer your question? Anybody else? Tom, I was going to add, I am from the local area. Um, I know that the ISA is a wonderful group to join and be involved with. I can tell you that uh, my personal experience has been I've networked with hundreds of people. Our chapter was actually invited to go to the international uh, ISA convention to show how we were doing it. Uh, some years back. Um, the folks who are here are passionate. Yep. And if you have passion for organization, secure yourself. That's the number one driver, in my opinion. Because if you don't love this as a career, you're not going to stay in it. It's just too hard. Yeah. And I think, you know, um, we're losing people at rapid speed. And I think one of the reasons that I wanted to do this talk is within in small organizations you don't have this problem, but with large organizations, how many of you are in risk? And then it, and how many people are more on the technical side? In most large organizations, those two groups don't even talk. Or there's like kind of weirdness between what that looks like. Um, and one of the things that I've been working with a lot of really large companies is how do we start cross-training people? Not that I want to take a pen tester and make them a risk person or vice versa, but can you imagine what the conversations would look like if you both understood on both sides what that role was, what that requirement is, and compliance and security are two different things, but they do meet in the middle and they do integrate. In my opinion, some people will say that it's not, but the way we do business, it is two things. Because this security was built on checking boxes, and how many of you, how many of the breaches do you think by show of hands were people actually compliant when the breach happened? And with PCI, you're only compliant to the moment of the breach. So technically you were compliant now, but the breach happened one second later and you're not compliant. But if you think about all that, a lot of them could check the boxes and say, we did all of these things. So it's, if I think part of learning and growing is understanding the different areas of security. I mean, even physical security, a lot of times is completely segmented from operations, from IT, from security, whatever, however it's grouped. And I think, think about like physical security. Does everything in physical security have an IP? It does. So if we're not looking at physical security, who can name a breach where uh, physical security was an issue? Yeah. TJ Maxx too with the wireless because it was their guest wireless. So, you know, and that's not just a complete, it's not 100% physical, but being able to have that access from the outside to in. Um, so the better conversations we can have, and I think there's a big push right now to cross train people so we can have better conversations. And I do think it'll help us on our journey um, because when you think about organized, I, I think cybersecurity is organized crime. It's the new mafia of today, but it's, not people going out necessarily shooting people, but um, 
But if you think about the damage that can be done from a security um, incident can be huge. I mean, if they could shut down ATMs for more than 48 hours, they shut down our food line, people will lose their, excuse me, they'll lose their shit. And, but that's all backed by an IP and technology. And so how many people think it's a people process and technology problem or a technology process and people or any mixture? What would you say security is? So in my opinion, I think people, process, and technology are the order. Because if you have only one of those, it doesn't work. So they all need to work together. And does technology do pretty much exactly what you tell it to do? So when breaches occur, is it a human error or is it a technology error? Well, the person usually programs technology. So right. all within the person. Right. And so, and, I, and it's not that all people are bad, but we're human. Like I, I remember, this has many years ago, worked with one of the largest Blue Cross Blue Shields and they spent, I think, almost $1 billion on their data center and their physical security. And the company I worked for at the time, what they brought us in, um, we dressed up as Verizon. The person at the front desk led us into their server room. We had complete administrative rights of all of the data center and they also forgot to turn the firewall on between the data center and their corporate, and we owned both within five minutes. So was that a technology problem, or was that a human problem? <laughs> and that was like one of the most uncomfortable meetings when I was sitting with their executives and trying to get not everyone to get fired, and I basically said, this is a learning exercise. And they fixed it, but, and it wasn't on purpose. I mean, they had this huge deadline, and it just got forgotten. It just was forgotten. So. That's why I think we always have to make sure we communicate and talk, and that constant learning is a huge component of that. So, at the Atlanta, I would say how to that. I ran into a bunch of people that had masters and other degrees and were switching over to become project managers. I really didn't know what way to sell them. I mean, if somebody's going to be a project manager or an overseer of SOC, like you said, if they are trained, they should go on to understand at least how that works. I mean, and not everyone agrees with me on this, but I'm a firm believer of like, I've always been in sales and business development, and one of the things I've always is really tried to understand the industry, and I'm not extremely technical, but I don't, I think it's difficult to manage or help drive a project or do anything if you don't understand what you're doing. So, and I mean, I get, I, I actually just, um, I've been talking to a lot of colleges where they have different um, teams and I get asked all the time, would you recommend me getting my master's degree before I ha you have any training? And of course I was, when I'm in colleges, I'm like, okay, how do I say this without getting myself in trouble? But you know, what I always tell people is like, if someone's paying for it, if you have that, I would say go for it because that may not always be paid for in the future. But I would recommend going getting experience in almost every major company can write off $5,250 for tuition reimbursement. Um, and they work with non-traditional colleges. They don't even really care if you're getting a degree, but use someone else's dollars. Because, I, I mean, I don't even know how people do it. I mean, the average cost for a four-year degree is $100,000 to $300,000. And I don't know about any of you, but by the time I was 16 to the time I was 18, there was no way I could potentially ever make an eighth of that. So, so um, I think I think you have to really figure out what your destiny destiny is. Um, I would also argue that very rarely do I see a master's degree required for a cybersecurity role, and even a lot of CISO roles require just a bachelor's. So I, I think it's just really what you're up to. And I would again, I'm not saying college education is not a good thing. It's just I think you have to look at what that looks like. And do you either want to be $150,000 in debt or three hundred dollars or $400,000 before you have your first job? And a lot of times when people get masters, they also assume that they're going to get paid a huge amount of money. And when you don't have experience, you generally aren't going to be able to yield a really high. I mean, you can get there, but your first job isn't going to generally do that. You recommended uh, getting a mentor. I also recommend uh, meeting a mentor. 
Yes. Wait until you're at the top of your game, yep. play your experience on top of it. If, if you've been doing it for three years, you could be a mentor to someone. And even I would say, like, um, the people in Columbus, we have a girl named Marissa Ball. She works in American Electric Power. Um, before she got into cybersecurity, she actually just did blood samples at Ohio Health. And she self taught herself, she taught herself how to do Linux. She set up a lab. And when she was interviewed at AAP, they interviewed 35 people, and all of them had experience. She had no experience. Um, and she was one of their top choices because of all the initiatives she took to learn on her own. And one of the things when I mentor people, and I would encourage anyone that's mentored, one of my requirements is um, if, you're, if anyone is a Buckeye fan, there's a huge saying about paying forward, and I'm a huge component of that. So if you've had mentors in your life that have helped you, then you also need to do that because if everyone mentored one person, we could really change some of the dynamics of what our industry looks like. Um, and I just feel like it's, I think it's important to give back because if all you do is take, then your opportunities are limited. So all, for all of you working in cyber, did you apply blindly? Could I show me hands? Did you just apply for a job and get it? Okay. I mean, it does happen. And then how many of you have jobs because you knew someone and they recommended you or referred you or told you about it? So that's kind of the, the norm. And I will say, um, I think when you get involved, just getting to know different people, like Paul and I used to work together and I encouraged him like, because he was great in cyber and I'm like, we need to bring you to the good side. <laughs> it's really dark. Um, and, you know, I mean, how many conversations did you and I have about that? We talked about it all the time, and now you're doing phenomenal in the industry. But sometimes just finding that person to encourage you to take the risk, um, but being willing to be open and learn is important. Was this helpful? Good. Any other questions? Do you have any information on these programs specifically for women, um, or young Young girls that are STEM uh, interested that may be interested in going into these type of fields, so any organizations that they could belong to. Something. And I, well, I could do some research if you want to email me. I'm in Ohio with you, so I also am a founding member of Ohio Cyber Women, and our focus is taking sixth grade girls to twelfth grade girls, um, and we've done two capture. We call them cyber games because another thing that's interesting in cyber. Um, for the women in the audience, when you look at descriptions, do you feel like they're written more for a man versus a woman? <clears throat> so I was just at um, this huge conference for Ohio Jobs, and I brought this up where there's all these studies that even in job descriptions, they're written more from a masculine perspective. And so a lot of women tend to not apply for jobs unless they come 80 to 100% of the requirements most men will, according to studies, will apply for a job with 30% of requirements. So, and I'm not saying that's good or bad or, or indifferent, but it's just the reality of it. So um, there are a lot of organizations popping up now. Um, there's another one that I also am on the board of. And part of the reason I'm on these boards is because I'm passionate about giving back and, and trying to work with the problem um, and I, I don't know if there'll be one in this area, but it's called ICMCP, which is the International Consortium of Minority and Women in Cybersecurity, and there's scholarships um, for that. And so even like the Empower group, um, part of our goal is to give new people scholarships to, to encourage them to go into the industry. Um, so I'll look and see if there's any here locally. I mean, we have a ton in Columbus that are kind of popping up, um, and I know all right, do they do this here? Because I know everyone's different. Like in Dublin, Ohio, which is a suburb, um, they, which is a more of an upscale suburb, they actually took an old Verizon building and turned it into a STEM program in cybersecurity um, and technology and science and math. Are So they're not giving the typical career, like pathways that you would generally in high school, where these kids potentially have internships and get involved. Do they do that in any of the schools here? They're starting to do that more and more in Columbus. You can do, when you get to high school, you can live within your junior or senior year, you can do um, co-ops uh, to where you've already 
against your uh, requirements to graduate, and you have free periods, you can go into the co-op program, and then they have uh, partnerships with businesses that you go to, but they're, from what I've seen, they're limited. Yeah. So you can't just choose whatever you want unless you actually take the initiative to go out and say, I want to go to this place and do an internship for my co-op and you know, go through the process of getting it vetted and approved by the school board, which is yeah. a hard thing to do, especially you know, when it comes to a field that isn't predominantly in you know, men or women, excuse me. Uh, so like my daughter, for example, you know, she, she likes STEM, she loves school, and she's uh, expressed a uh, uh, desire to, to do this uh, Harry Potter coated wand. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, this is interesting, you know, and I'm not that type of parent forced my child into doing anything. Yeah. It's interesting that she chose this because she's never done anything technological in that aspect before. Uh, and it's something that she wants to grow into and I want to foster that, but there's no organization that I'm aware of in the Lexington area uh, for young women uh, or for youth, uh, for that example, or, or you know, for youth at all in regards to like the cyber security technology realm um, until you get to like middle school or high school. Uh, so, well, and what I found interesting is that the studies are also showing. I don't know about you guys, but when I was in sixth grade, I was not thinking about what I was going to do for the rest of my life. But the studies are showing that kids by sixth grade know what they're going to do, which that just blows me away. I think it changes a lot. I mean, and it depends on parents. But I mean, you should maybe talk to, I'm not trying to throw the ISSC board <laughs> or work, but um, you guys should talk to some of the groups and see um, if you can do something like that. Because I mean, I'm just doing like a, so when we do our capture of the flag for the sixth grade girls, which is predominantly sixth grade, we buy them all Raspberry Pis, and we teach them how to load them. We teach them how to code a few games, and we teach them some basic Linux code. Um, and then we have like a lock picking village. We left. We had old computers that were donated. They start pre pulling those apart, and we walk through the parts. And we sold both of the classes out in seventy. Or basically, we didn't sell it. It was free. But it filled the classes in 72 hours. And the girls, when they left, they were so excited. I mean, and we're like, we're going to see you in, you know, five or six years in cybersecurity. And we're trying to keep in touch with them. So we're trying to mentor these girls and encourage them um, to go there. And I mean, for me, I'm about mentoring everyone. I'm really about inclusion versus separation. Because I think regardless of where people on the spectrum of how we think, we have to figure out ways to work together. Um, so I would see if maybe you could um, talk to some of the groups and maybe host like two of them a year because it's not, I mean, you need a little bit of money, but you, I, I'm pretty sure most companies have money for diversity and inclusion um, and we have had no problems getting um, sponsorship. I was even for like the women's gala um, within a week of us putting it out, we had like 20 sponsors because people wanted to support what we were doing. So you could basically get sponsors to pay for it. And a lot of times like Cisco and some of the hardware people will a lot of times donate hardware too. So, I mean, it takes some orchestration, but um, I would encourage that some of the things you can talk amongst the community and see if you guys could potentially <coughs> add something. And start off slow because you wanna, you know, you don't wanna go from zero to a hundred, but start with one, see where it's going and um, and you know that's just one step towards the right direction. But I'll look and see if I can find anything. I'm just not familiar with this area, but I mean, if I can find something, I'm happy to send it to you. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, thank you for attending. Oh, uh, there's a group called the Girl Development. Yeah. Uh, National, and and they're they're fairly active locally. Yeah. Although I don't think they do much in the security space. They're more you know, programming games and apps and things like that. Yeah, the like girls that code and yeah, yeah. So I mean, that's a good way. It's not cybersecurity, but it's kind of getting in that STEM, and then they could potentially move in. And because I think the other struggle is, I don't know how many companies are going to hire a high school kid just out of high school in a cybersecurity job. They need to get some fundamentals. But um, you know, I know in Ohio, I, I don't know if the legislation is passed 
or it's getting close, but they're requiring like cyber cleansing from kindergarten to 12th grade. So cybersecurity is going to be built in to curriculum. And it's more about more like have teaching get kids good habits online because obviously with bullying and everything else. Um, so we're, they're trying to introduce some of those concepts and the goal is and hopefully that someone will find interest in the cybersecurity space. So, well, thank you for coming. Thank you.